The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, 2016 is going to be the same as 1988 in every way. Oh no, St. Elsewhere is going to get canceled. What? 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 Dark Victory and Bright Sushi. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. We have part one of a two-part interview with Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis discussing their new Ring of Fire novel, 1635, A Parcel of Rogues. This one takes place in England and is all about Oliver Cromwell, who turns out not to be such a Puritan after all. Andrew Dennis is a font of cool English history and pretty witty, so this one is going to be fun. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now the news. Fireworks for the new hardcovers and trade paperbacks of 2016. Out now is A Parcel of Rogues, the new Ring of Fire series entry by Andrew Dennis and Eric Flint, who we'll be talking with shortly. Also out in January is Dark Victory, a novel of the alien resistance by Brendan Du Bois. Last heard in these parts, Brendan was discussing creativity with Lois Bujold and Wynne Spencer. Uh, and that was a September podcast, I believe. Brendan is a critically acclaimed mystery writer, but this is his science fiction debut. He claims that science fiction has always been his first love. This is a non-stop, hard-hitting novel of humanity fighting back after an alien apocalypse, and it's got a really appealing uh, main viewpoint hero. Also out is another debut novel that is Unforgettable by Eric James Stone, who has been very successful as a short story writer. This one has fun and excitement. It's a near-future thriller with a hero who is forgotten five minutes after you meet him. The rules of this quantum game are fun in themselves in the book, since he is a CIA operative, and his bosses have to actually know who he is, or do they? 1635, A Parcel of Rogues, Dart Victory, and Unforgettable are now available at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hi. Hello. Eric Flint is a modern master of alternate history fiction with over 3 million books in print. He's the creator of the New York Times bestselling Ring of Fire series. He's the author of many excellent short stories and novellas, including a really good one in the upcoming mass market publication, uh, Tooth and Claw, that will be out this spring, which is this themed alternate Paleolithic anthology that Jody Lynn Nye and, and some others are also in. Uh, with David Drake, Eric has written six popular novels in the Belisarius alternate Byzantine history series. And with David Weber, collaborated on 1633 and 1634, The Baltic War, which we may discuss, and Honorverse entries in the Crown of Slaves uh, subseries. He's the co-author of many other novels and series with writers such as David Freer, Reiki Spore, Charles Gannon, Katie Wentworth, and the list just goes on and on. Andrew Dennis is the co-author with Eric Flint of New York Times bestseller, 1634, The Galileo Affair, one of my favorites in the Ring of Fire series. He has stories in the Ring of Fire anthologies and has had many nonfiction pieces published on the subject of law and the paranormal. Andrew is a retired lawyer. He lives in Preston, England. Uh, out now at Booksellers Everywhere is a new Ring of Fire series entry, 1635, A Parcel of Rogues, by Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis. Uh, for those who don't know, the Ring of Fire series is about a modern-day West Virginia town that gets thrown back into the middle of Europe in 1632, and it all starts in Eric's novel, 1632. The series and anthologies that 1632 have spawned are like the stars. 
Uh, the Galileo Fear, like I mentioned, was one of my absolute favorites in the Ring of Fire series. Uh, read it years ago when I was writing ad copy on it. So, uh, you've written another one together. A Parcel of Rogues, The English Civil War, um, which hasn't happened yet in the Ring of Fire timeline, I don't think, and may not. I don't know what you have planned. Uh, Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell. For those of us who only vaguely recall the events of the English uh, Civil War from uh, high school or college, can you give us a gloss of that? Oh, uh, Andrew, you want to do it? <laughs> I, th I think I will, yes. Um, not least of which, the first thing is not just the English Civil War. Um, certainly, uh, um, for the last sort of, well, quite some time really, they've been calling it the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland. Obviously, the Welsh took part, but nobody pays any much attention to them. Um, uh, and <laughs> I hope we don't have any <laughs> Welsh listeners. <laughs> Oh, I, I, well, if, if I was certain we did, I'd, I'd start making sheet jokes. Um, <laughs> don't worry, they love it, really. Um, uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the civil wars, I mean, they're, they're pretty much guaranteed to happen. Uh, one of the things you have to remember is that uh, the Tudor-Stuart dynasty, of which um, Charles Stuart is absolutely the worst example, um, produced a spectacular series of truly incompetent monarchs, uh, but for... Uh, the brilliantly named Ibrahim the Halfwit of the Ottoman Empire, Charles Stuart, would be the single stupidest monarch of the 17th century. Um, uh, and he managed um, to get, you know, the normally polite, reserved, retiring English uh, riled up for a civil war. Um, I mean, he was obviously going to get the Irish and Scots fighting because um, that that was the way things worked back then in those countries. Um, but it, it's not just one war either. Um, there, there's two Scots civil wars, two English civil wars, an Irish rebellion, um, and what they call the Irish Confederacy. They actually ended up invading Scotland briefly. But it starts with Charles Stuart's attempts to impose bishops on the Church of Scotland, contrary to the um, National Covenant, which, which, if I can summarise in two words, is nee puppery. Um, the, the Scots objected to that, um, and th there was a brief war over that. that. All right. Well, att attempts to to get England to pay for that um, was absolutely to pay for the, uh, the the bishops' war in Scotland was absolutely the last straw uh, for the parliamentary party in England. Um, so they started their civil war. Meanwhile, uh, the Irish, who'd been encouraged somewhat by the Earl of Strafford, um, because he'd suggested putting together an Irish army to to down the Scots rebels. Um, and if you, if you think this is getting complicated now, um, I am giving you the short and simple version. Um, uh, so they, they have the Irish Rebellion of 1641, one of many. Um, the Covenanters in Scotland, which was the uh, anti-monarchy forces in Scotland, the ones who were uh, standing up firmly for no popery, uh, joined in the English Civil War or making it a civil war of the whole of the island of Great Britain in 1643. That lasted until uh, 1646. Um, the Irish Rebellion then turned into, while this is going on, the Irish Rebellion turns into the Irish Confederation, who briefly invaded Scotland, and that started a full-on civil war in Scotland as well. Um, eventually, Charles Stuart managed, with his usual display of competence, to lose that. Um, by 1646, and there's a brief period um, during which they were negotiating. Um, Charles Stuart negotiated in shocking bad faith, um, and uh, between the parliamentary grandees and the new model army, they uh, they all took sufficient offence to start the second civil war uh, in England and the Covenant has invaded again. Um, they actually got as far south as, uh, as Preston, where I am now. Um, then that second civil war ends with, uh, Charles I, uh, being arrested in Scotland, handed over to England and beheaded in 1649. Um, at which point Parliament declared a republic in England who which wasn't recognised in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, Charles II uh, became uh, monarch there, but obviously remained 
uh, out of uh, out of power in England until 1660, at which point uh, we have the Restoration and all of a sudden uh, we have a merry monarch and a resurgence of the arts. Uh, I think basically because everyone was sick of fighting. But that's that's the very brief version. But the um, the uh, the I mean the thing that that we get taught at least is that uh, it it's sort of the the beginning of the parliamentary mon the constitutional monarchy um the idea that yes you can just do what you want with a king if he doesn't <laughs> um that really wasn't a war aim until um until the, the second civil war um parliament had ancient rights um that, that had developed over the years that the, the king was expected um, to govern out of his own resources. I mean, still the biggest landholder uh, in the country. Um, and, and if he wanted taxes or forced loans, he either had to rely on uh, the old common law uh, customs and excise duties, or he had to get Parliament's consent for, a, for tax. Um, uh, and that was more or less the limit, uh, the limit of Parliament's powers, um, and, and that and a, that and approving legislation. It isn't really until um, until they limited Charles the First's height that they really started limiting uh, royal power as well. Um, so it. And, and, and I am simplifying that massively. Um, yeah. I, you know, if there was an actual uh, professor of history here, he'd be slapping me around the back of the head and calling me an idiot boy. Um, but, but for for present for the purposes of a, of a podcast that's going to last less than twelve hours, that's that's the version I can yeah. give you. Well, where um, are we um, it, within the Ring of Fire timeline? How do, how does it intercept intersect to this? Um, historic timeline well they were about five right now six five to six years roughly before everything would have blown open in real history but what happened very, not very long after during the fire is that charles king charles got his hands on history books and so basically he launched a, what amounts to a preemptive civil war um, by yes. arresting and, in some cases, executing a bunch of people who would have been prominent figures in the Civil War, who he, hadn't, he, as of yet, done much was, of anything. He read what was going to happen to him, in other words, and decided to... Right, okay. and decided to, to, to you know, scrangle it in the crib. So, in the novel 1633, which is the second novel in the series, um, the delegation from the uh, actually the Confederated Principalities of Europe is what it's called at that point because the United States of Europe hasn't been formed yet mostly consisting of Americans shows up in London and they get essentially arrested although no one's calling it that but in practice they basically get arrested and thrown into the Tower of London um, and while they're there Oliver Cromwell is arrested and brought to the Tower of London also uh, they begin initiating a contact with Oliver Cromwell while they're both in the Tower of London. So essentially, everything's kind of short circuited. So what's now going to happen uh, is up to the fertile imaginations of the authors. Uh, and Andrew and I did the next stage of it, uh, which is what appears in. Parcel of uh, the the earlier stuff was in uh, 1634, the Baltic War. Uh, you find it both in 1633 and then in 1634, the Baltic War. It's in 1634, the Baltic War, that the people imprisoned in the Tower of London are are freed by um, a commando expedition led by Harry Lefferts, um, and when they free. The Americans in the Tower of London, they also free Oliver Cromwell. Mm -hmm. So he flees, and also Thomas Wentworth, who by then the Earl, uh, was the Earl of Stratford, he was stripped his title. He was in favor for a while, and then he's now out of favor and was himself in prison. So they, they get all of them out. And what happens is 
most of them go back to the continent, but some of them stayed in England. And the Baltic War, that novel did not take up what happened with them. And so the book Andrew and I have written, which is coming out in about a week, is one of the two sequels to the Baltic War. Yeah. So you're Cromwell. Um, he's, uh, he's a great character in the book. Uh, he's very nuanced. He has a girlfriend. Um, uh, he also has kids. What, where was he with his, with being married and Johnson. such, by the way? Um, anyway, what, what's the parcel of rogues Cromwell like? Where, who is he? Well, um, I, oh, I oh. <laughs> let me just you, say a few words and I'm going to let, uh, Andrew talk. Uh, I, he, Cromwell's just an utterly fascinating character in history. And so when I wrote, uh, 1633 Day Weber, there was no way I was not going to include him in the, in the series. Uh, now keep in mind, the Cromwell that we encounter is a man in his 30s. He's, you know, quite a bit younger than the Cromwell that's known from history who really didn't become prominent until the 1640s. And we've got him arrested seven years earlier than that. Um, I tried to do the image, the portrait of him that you first see in 1633 based on, you know, what his personality seems to have been like. Um, and then we just took it from there. It's, you know, you're in this, you know, as always happens in author in history, when you're, you're picking out someone's life much earlier than they in real history would have started becoming really prominent, you know, it's kind of, uh, You've got quite a bit of latitude where you can go. You, know, you try to stay true to what seems to have been the nature of the person's character. But, uh, I mean, there's certainly no doubt Cromwell's very forceful personality. He was extremely capable. Um, and what Andrew and I tried to do was carry that forward. Now, a lot of changes have happened. For one thing, by I don't want, um, I don't want to do any spoilers here, but... Uh, He's now quite closely associated with two Americans, one of whom is an Irish American, Irish nationalist. Um, so that brings in a very interesting ingredient into the mix, uh, because he starts off very hostile to Cromwell, um, because of Cromwell's role in Irish history and real history. Um, so, you is know, that, from uh, there on, we just were writing down. I mean, now I'm going to let Andrew talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, sticking, sticking with what we know historically about Cromwell from uh, before the date he's arrested in the novel. Um, we're talking about a guy who went up to university and was principally famous for being, you know, a college athlete. Um, he was your classic jock. 17th century um, undergraduate sports being tad rougher than the modern version. Um, uh, you know, um, football back then was um, not much different to a riot. <laughs> um, and also, uh, you know, quite, quite a prominent horseman. And then he drops out, um, family circumstances, um, began but didn't really complete training as a lawyer, um, Ends up moving back to Norfolk as, uh, Norfolk, sort of Norfolk Lincolnshire border, actually. The county boundaries have changed a bit since then. Um, uh, as, as, you know, one of the local gentry. And practically the first thing he does when he's serving as a justice of the peace is get into a huge amount of trouble over local implementation of the poor law. Um, in which basically, you know, he, he actually stands up to City Hall despite actually being part of City Hall, um, and ends up hauled before the Privy Council to apologize for intemperate language. Um, uh, now he would, in, in our timeline, he would go on to, um, you know, become an advocate for the Fen people who were displaced by the big drainage projects that were getting started at the time, most of which are, are still there. You can still go and, uh, you know, drive a boat along them to this day. Um, there's, there's only about, uh, 30 or 40 acres of, of old fat, you know, un, unimproved Fen left. And the old, uh, I mean, essentially, uh, tribesmen, uh, that used to live there were just slowly but surely driven out. Um, uh, and, 
uh, but he he actually stood up for me you know he became known as the lord of the fens he's he's actually in uh in the um state papers for the late 1630s as as a noted local pain in the backside uh for um for central government um and also during that period and and it's something that happened just before um the the, the whole arrest thing that we do in the books um he uh he basically had a, a, a certain amount of personal financial failure and ended up uh broken down from being a member of the gentry to basically being a tenant farmer trying to rebuild his fortune uh and in the course of that uh, a chap with no particular religious uh sentiments um under underwent what we now call radicalization except of course this is rural england so it's a very polite you know well-mannered um radicalization and, and and became uh one of the godly in a in a much more activist sense um and that gets interrupted by uh an arrest that um i mean you know there's the old joke that a that a, a liberal is a conservative who's been arrested um and, and somebody who was previously standing up for the little guy is now going to be made very much more against um central government uh and gets radicalized in a more political direction as well as having for quite a long time from uh for months you know his only real human contact is either the um the cpe party in the tower or the warders who are spending a lot of time interacting with the cpe party in the tower which is going to to build on that early how can i put this uh joie de vivre and and turn it away from the rather grim direction he took in our timeline but nevertheless still very much radical very much uh the kind of uh individual who would speak truth to power uh, so we're going to get so we have a uh happier less puritanical cromwell um less fire and brimstone and more um righteousness before god if you see what i mean um there's there's a negative and a positive aspect to to that particular brand of fundamentalist religion and he's less politicized towards the the negative version you give him a pretty uh, good uh you give him a pretty good sense of humor, a droll sense of humor in the book. Did he really have that? Um, is that how you see, you both see Oh, him? yeah, he was quite well known for it. Uh, <laughs> mind you, some of his humor got pretty grim, but, uh, uh, yeah, you can find it in the history books that he had. Uh, he was, yeah. you know, he had a wit. There's no question about it. Uh, yeah. We make him generally, well, I mean, keep in mind, we, we in 1633, we start off with having his wolf and one of his children killed uh, by the uh, by British soldiers. So he starts off, and then he's thrown in prison for almost a year. So he starts off pissed as all hell. Um, but part of what happens is that he is, as is true all through this series, he's influenced by, to one degree or another, by the American Dean County. Um and if you have a particular little twist because one of the Americans is Irish by ancestry and is very consciously Irish. It's not just sort of, oh yeah, I'm American. His family are, you know, supporters of, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, you know, aid and all the rest of it. Uh, so he's quite political in that respect. So. Is that, um, there's no question for, is that Daryl? Yeah. No. Which of the Lefferts gang is that? That's, That's Daryl McCarthy. He's not actually at any point part of Harry Leopard's wrecking crew. He was Harry Leopard's best friend back before the Ring of Fire and in the early days of the Ring of Fire. But then they actually part go through their separate ways because Leopard's gets involved with what becomes known as the wrecking crew, which Daryl's never part of. Daryl goes off to England and then of course he's invested. So he's in England. Daryl and, and, and Harry used to be, be you know, were best friends at one time, but they haven't seen each other now in uh, oh, at least two years, two, three years. I'm not sure exactly how long. Um, I'd have to go back and, you know, check the records. But uh, uh, so uh, Daryl's an old friend of Harry's, but he was never actually part of the record group. 
So well, they did run across. They did run across each other, of course, when Lefferts freed him from the Tower of London. But they, they then immediately went their separate ways again. Who who are the characters that Cromwell escapes from the Tower of London with? And and we spend the first about you know a quarter of the the first part of the book on the run with these people. Well, they're, the Americans are Daryl McCarthy and Gail Mason and Julie Sims. Those three. Then, uh, by then, Daryl is married. Or, or, no, he gets married. Andrew, I'd forgotten. Is, he's not married um, at the beginning of Parcel Road. He's, right? he's, he's um, all but married. I, th I think they're waiting until um, they, they can get a, a full scale family party together. Um, uh, I. There's a bit of sneaking in <laughs> windows and such. I believe. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, there's yeah. that. I mean, um, he's he's married to Vicky Short, who's one of the Yeoman Warder group. Um, and Gail Mason, who's American, has stayed with the, the group. Um, Julie Sims is with the group. Of course, she's married to Alex McKay, and they're now all of them are on their way back to to Scotland because Alex needs to get back to Scotland, and. Cromwell needs to get back to the fan country so they find what happened to his children. Um, and then the other members of the party, there's a, a yeoman warder named Stephen Hamilton, who was kind of the grand and very grim old man of the yeoman warders who uh, wound up being allied with the Americans. And he decided to stay. And what am I? Oh, and then for a period of time, there are three English officers. Who, who they they peel away earlier, but they're the ones who in Baltic War were were uh, uh, the Earl of Cork tried to frame them up for for what happened to uh, the King and the Queen, and they wound up escaping, and so they are now hooked up with Lefferts, but they stay in England, and the three of them wind up later on in the story going back to Connor because they appear in my novel 1635, The Eastern Front. And by the time they show up there, they're officers uh, in Mike Stern's army. Um, but for this book, part of this book, they're with that group that's created in England. Have I forgotten anybody, Andrew? Uh, no, I, I think that, I think that covers everybody. Uh, kind of our, 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 one of our main characters that's from Uptime um, is uh, is Daryl. Um, he's he's a great character. He's He's kind of an engineer, right? I mean, he's a he's a, he's a car self-taught, <laughs> yes, a car mechanic who's yeah. been forced to become an engineer. Yeah, and also also a, a you know a, a professional miner, which is which is a, a skill that um, which requires a lot of engineering knowledge. I mean, going underground and digging out coal, you don't do that unless you're fairly well trained these days. Uh, you know, he's gonna he's gonna know a certain amount of a certain amount of. Uh, Engineering, just from that, and and yeah, as as on the side, he can fix cars, <laughs> which is something he's. I from, modeled uh, Daryl and Daryl and Harry Lefferts appear as early as 1632 in the series. Um, in fact, they're in the very early chapters of the first book in the series, and I modeled them after guys I went to high school with. In um, for a period of time, I went to a rural high school in the mountains of California, which. I mean, these are California hillbillies is what it amounted to. Um, mostly transplanted from Oklahoma. Um, and there's a certain type. You can find it all over the United States. Oh, yeah. um, they tend to you know, the get world. a high school education and not much more. They tend to have dismantled it and put back together their first car at the age of six. Um, you know, some of them tend to be pretty roughhouse in a kind of cheerful sort of way. Um, and that's what both Harry and Daryl like. I mean, I, I didn't model them after any specific individual I knew, but I modeled them after a certain type that I knew quite well. And, you know, they're, they're pretty good guys, basically. Not that they, I mean, I, I have just finished a short novel dealing further with Harry Lefferts that will be appearing during the Fire Four anthology, uh, where he finally gets involved for the first time in the series, in the series of romance. But, that's what these guys are like. Uh, and what we're seeing, but when we start the series in the year 1631, they're in their 
23, 24, 25, somewhere in that age range. And by now they're close to either at or close to 30. So they're growing up. I mean, you know, they're, they're, uh, they pass that period when you're about 25 when your brain finally ceases to develop and you can gauge risks properly, <laughs> which is the reason <laughs> car insurance companies won't insure you until you get to be 25. Uh, yeah. And so, to some degree, they're slowing down a little bit, uh, in the sense they're not quite as reckless as they were when they were younger. But that's what they're modeled on. And uh, they're a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. The, um, let's talk about that chase a little more. I mean, the um, the, the getting, going towards Scotland and, the, and I guess... Um, wherever Cromwell's trying to end up. The it was just fun to to realize how backward and rural England was. I mean they they really have trouble getting directions, right? I that I actually I I, I wrote a, a big chunk of that based on Eric's complaints when he visited London a few years back. <laughs> Complaining, <laughs> complaining that nothing was at right angles to anything else, and who? Well, you know, it wasn't like. just that. It's that you can be on a street, and every block or every other, every second block, the street changes name. I mean, <laughs> that's what really got to me. It wasn't so much that the street sort of crooked around. Okay, fine, but you're on the same street, but all of a sudden it's got a different name. Uh, although I, I will I, say I, that the most, the most frustrating episode in that respect I ever had in the British Isles was when my wife and I were in Western Ireland, which is in the Gale Tract, and so all of the street signs were in the Gaelic. Signs. <laughs> all the street signs were in Gaelic, which is fine, but the maps were all in English, so you could not match <laughs> the name on a map or just the name on the actual sign because they were in two separate languages. Anyway, never mind. Uh, Andrew wrote that whole stretch. I mean, all I did was, was just advise as an editor because that's entirely Andrew. I could not possibly have written that. It, that requires, um, I, I find an absolutely charming part of the book, but it, it, you know, just that immersion in, in, in English local minutia is the kind of thing I simply could not have written it. I wouldn't have even tried actually. Yeah. I would have just um, been very different. Uh, no, so Andrew wrote all that over. Yeah, uh, the, the the thing um, that I think a lot of um, American readers won't get, um, especially if you've grown up in America, is that very little of America has been farmed for more than three hundred years. Um, whereas you know the Fen country has been inhabited um, and and farmed for um, you know a couple of thousand years at least. Um, and and over time, the the field patterns, you know, they've been building up since. Um, Everything got reorganized after the, 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 the sort of 12th and 13th centuries, um, when, um, things shifted from sort of early medieval to late medieval and then, the, then early modern. Um, it, it's, you, you get a similar sort of effect to, uh, you know, the Bocage country of, of northern France that, uh, um, the, the Normandy landings had such trouble with, um, which is that the, the field boundaries, um, have been built up so much and, and the lanes have sunken so much through literally millennia of wear that you end up with these great big trenches. Um, and, and, you know, even, even in the, 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 the less overgrown North Country I live in, uh, uh, within an hour's drive of where I'm sitting right now, there are places where in summertime I get lost and I grew up here. Um, simply because, um, it, it is, you know, you, you've, you've got hedgerows that, that, that have been there a thousand years and, and they get kind of big. Um, and you literally cannot see from, from one, uh, one side of the, uh, one side of the road to the, to the other. It's, it's that overgrown. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's, again, it's, it's, it's something I think you have to have, have grown up in a rather older country to grasp just how old a lot of the stuff around here is. I mean, all of the pubs, um, all of the, the taverns and the inns and the pubs that uh, that get mentioned in the book um, are, are all still open to this day, um, with the exception of the Falcon at, uh, at uh, Huntingdon there, which was um, one of Cromwell's recruiting stations during the Civil War. And that closed down a few years ago. Um, and, uh, there was, uh, back when I was first doing the research for this, um, something of a campaign going to reopen that 
of the historic historic uh, pub. Uh, but uh, I don't know how that turned out. I should really look that up, actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, with, <laughs> you, you're dealing with the minutiae of life in a country where where there are pubs a thousand years old. That was part one of a two-part interview with Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis, authors of Ring of Fire series entry 1635, A Parcel of Rogues. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 20 We've got survivors on this one, Sophia called over the intercom. Life raft. Looks like two people. People. People, people. Roger, Steve said, looking up from his paperwork. He'd known there was going to be paperwork, but there had to be a better way. They'd been clearing for two weeks since towing the Victoria and picked up two more usable boats. Both had survivors, and A, they had agreed to help out, and B, they were experienced, and C, it was their boat. So Sophia was still running the con. They also had found more than 20 survivors in life rafts and lifeboats, including more from the voyage under stars. Steve didn't even sway as Sophia swung the boat around to back up to the life raft. He did check his pistol and taser, though. A couple of the survivors had been problems. They'd settled by pulling two wrecked sailboats off the shore of Jew Bay and putting them on those, solidly anchored in the harbor. One for men, one for women. That had come about due to the accusation on the part of one of the female survivors that she'd been raped by one of the males. And it just made sense. Mike didn't think that he'd want to be on one of those boats, but there wasn't much else they could do at the moment. Steve stepped out onto the back deck as Sophia backed up towards the life raft. Throw your line to the man on the deck, Sophia said over the loud hailer. Exit junior person first, senior last. Last person out, pull the wire on the EPIRB before boarding. After boarding, you'll have to wash down on the back deck to decontaminate. After that, we'll get you some food. By the way, welcome to Wolf's Floating Circus and Rescue Flotilla. You're welcome. The man threw the line, then pulled the wire from the EPIRB. Steve pulled the raft alongside and helped the woman onto the deck, then the man. Thank you, the guy said. He wasn't exactly ugly, looked at in the right light, but he wasn't a beauty either. Big as hell. His skin was flat black as an ace of spades. Who's Wolf? My actual nickname in the Paris was Wolfsbane, Steve said. Got around to one of my daughters and got changed to Wolf or Papa Wolf. Steve Smith, captain of the Tina's Toy and somewhat against my will and I quote, Commodore of this lash-up and the name wasn't my idea. I really don't care if you're called the Devil's Own, the woman said, grinning. I'm just so glad to be off that boat. I'm Sadie Curry, Captain Smith. Thomas Fontana, the man said. Paris. Not Brit or Irish. Aussie with lots of time in the States? Southern States. Paris or SAS? Paris, Steve said, surprised. Brother was a Goldie. Sorry, Thomas said, shrugging. Any idea on him? Last I heard, he was on a flight to a secure point, Steve said. Long story. Let's get you washed down and some food in you. There is probably something worse than being stuck on a cruise ship unarmed in a zombie uprising, Fontana said, 
popping two sushi rolls in at a time. Food, he muttered past the mouthful. Thomas was special forces, Sadie said. I think I got that right. I didn't know anything about the army until we ended up on the raft. She grimaced and shrugged. That was right, Thomas? Green berets? Fontana nodded, trying to clear his mouth of rice and tuna. He took a sip of tea and just sighed through his nose. God, this is good, he muttered. Most of the boats from the cruise ships are, well, boats, Stacy said. I couldn't make it to one, Fontana said. There was an open door and I went out, outside. There were rafts in the water. I was running from a zombie and he saved me, Sadie said, grabbing his arm. My hero. I threw him over the side, Fontana said, shrugging. Then I had to deal with him when he went over, but we got into a raft. There was another guy, Terry. Can we skip that? Sadie asked, looking pleafully at Steve. He had to do what? He had to do it. He turned. Strangulation? Steve asked, taking a sip of tea. Yeah, Fontana said, looking at him oddly. The only people who have survived in the lifeboats are people who have killed zombies, Stacy said, shrugging. And generally, the only way to do that is strangulation. On a life raft, you can't even avoid it. It was horrible, Sadie said, tearing up. Most of the world is, Steve said. But it has some compensations. What? Fontana asked. We're doing good work, Steve said. The sea is beautiful when it's not trying to kill us. Need help? Fontana asked. I sort of need to get some food in me, but if I can help, I'd like to. We always need help, Steve said. What did you do in the... ranges, was it? Bite your tongue, Fontana said. Fifth Special Forces Group. I was an 18 Bravo. Cross train and 18 Echo and Delta. Six times in the stands, some training time in Africa. You? Rifle sergeant, Steve said. Also in the stands. Then later, a history teacher. Question, did you happen to know someone named Donny, who was a special forces officer? Know him? No, Fontana said. He was out before I joined, but I've heard of him. Missing both legs? He was, unfortunately, a casualty, Steve said, nodding. Okay, I'd say you're in. No, I'm not a poser. Fontana said, grinning. And I notice your wife's wearing a pistol, and you're wearing a pistol and taser. Still. Problems? Some, Steve said. But we deal with them as they come along. How do you feel about clearance? With a crowbar? Fontana asked. Not so happy. With a firearm? Please. Are you sure, honey? Sadie asked unhappily. We're not going to send him in unprepared. Steve said. Among other things, we still have some vaccine. That goes first to clearance personnel, and we're careful to avoid bites and blood spray. But we do need more people willing to do active clearance. We have two vessels waiting for clearance teams. We were on our way to one of them, and right now it's only myself and my daughter doing it. You're afraid if you give me a gun, I'll try to take over, Fontana said, nodding. Makes sense. All I can say is that until something better comes along, I'm your man. I'd like to get a piece back from these zombies, and I'm seriously missing my gun collection. The one thing I'd like to know, though, is there anything in it? I mean, I'll help out, but what is it? Share and share alike? More or less, Steve said. Clarence teams get a spiff on every boat they clear. Besides, first choice of loot, which is pretty obvious. The real question is... How open-minded are you about your partner? So how do you usually handle this? Fontana said, trying not to be amused by the 13-year-old girl in full assault rig. Usually like this, Faith said, drawing her H&K. She measured the catenary carefully and shot the zombie, clawing at them from the back deck of a 60-foot fishing boat. The round hit the zombie high on the right chest. It clawed at the wound for a moment, then slipped on its own blood and fell over the side. Then the sharks take care of it for us, she said. Works for me, 
Fontana said. You got a handle? She-wolf, Faith said, reloading the expended round in her magazine, then seating it again. Got a problem with that? No, ma'am, Fontana said. Seriously? Fontana said, as he levered open the stuck hatch. I'd heard of Voltaire, but I never really got into that kind of tunes. Seriously, it was a hoot, Faith said, as a zombie arm clawed out of the compartment. Hang on a sec. She lifted her saga and put it to the doorway. Where, bouncers? Roger, Fontana said, holding the hatch gapped. You want some? Faith said, firing the saga. The arm started spasming. Who else, huh? Watched a lot of aliens, have we? Fontana said. Love that movie. You? You want some? Wait, Faith said, holding out her hand as Fontana started to step over the combing. Looks clear, Fontana said, flashing his tactical light around the compartment. Zombies do not like impolite people, Faith said. Always announce your presence. Zombies, 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 Ali Ali oxen free. That is so wrong, Fontana said. You're used to trying to sneak up on people, Faith said, as there was a scuffling sound. There. The zombie was emaciated and clearly on its last legs. She put a round to the infected's chest as it stumbled towards the lights. Where the hell did that come from? Fontana said, waving the light around again. Dad thinks they spend a lot of time sleeping, really deep to conserve energy. So, make enough noise to wake the dead? Fontana said, chuckling. Something like that. Zombies? Zombies, zombies. Come to supper. I wonder what most of this stuff does, Fontana said looking around the engineering compartment. I mean, obviously, there's the engines. Yeah, Faith said. Never futz with the engineering compartment. If there's a zombie in it, let it out and take it out in the corridor. You get one bad round in engineering and you don't know what's gonna go wrong. I think we need a manual, Fontana said. I think we need to find a seal or something who knows how to do this. Pistol, Faith said shaking her head as the zombie came up the companionway. Okay, Fontana said, changing weapons. He put a round into the zombie's chest, then went for a double tap and missed the headshot. Damn it, Faith said, ducking back as the round carooned off the deck and fortunately into the darkness below. That's why I said pistol. One round, targeted. One zombie, one round, no bouncers. Roger. Fontana said. Sorry. I shouldn't have snapped, Faith said. I sunk a boat that way, though. How many times have you done this? Fontana asked. I don't know, Faith said, drawing her H and K and tagging the next zombie coming up the companionway. I'll have to check a log. Boats this size, only three. Small yachts, 20 or so. Jesus. And there I was floating around in a raft. So now we use Daz's superty duperty new gimmick, Faith said, looking at the beetles askance. They were clambering around the interior of the bag that made her more ill than bloated zombie bodies. Think it will work? Fontana asked dubiously. He said give it a few days and leave the interior hatches open, Faith said dropping the beetles into the interior and shutting the exterior hatch. We'll see. Holy cow, Steve said as they approached the target boat. Oh, Sophia said. Can I have that one? It wasn't so much that the boat was large. The Victoria was larger. It was that it was just enormous and beautiful. Sleek as hell. It looked fast and it was darn big. It's probably trashed, Steve said, and it'd be a bitch to maintain. I'll do it, Sophia said. You sound like you're asking for a puppy, Steve said. Besides, I want it. The problem will be finding anybody who knows how to run the engine room. 
And it will be up to the captain's board. Assuming it's not trashed. No zombies on deck, Sophia said, circling the drifting yacht. Did they even board? His sea fit, Steve said. I'll go get rigged up. I'm going to turn over to Paula, Sophia said, picking up the intercom mic. You're going to need somebody who knows how to run the dinghy. Dinghies and lifeboats are all gone, Steve said, boarding the yacht on its flush transom deck. It was just about the easiest boarding he'd done in some time. Did they abandon ship? Sophia asked. You tell me, Steve said. Want me to back you up? Sophia asked. Up to you, Steve said. You're not an armor, and if there are bouncers, that's an issue. I'll take my chances, Sophia said, tossing him the mooring line. This I want to see. Oh, da, I want, Sophia said, sighing at the helm. The 92-foot Hatteras Elite, dubbed Livin' Large, was only about 30 feet longer than the toy, but that made a huge difference, and the interior was that much nicer, not to mention being in much better shape. In fact, except for signs of rapid exit from the boat, there appeared to be no damage at all. Log, Sophia said, pulling out a standard log book and flipping to the last page with writing. Then flipping back. Chief engineer and a mate went zombie. According to the log, they're locked in the crew compartment. Ran out of fuel, no power. The rest of the people abandoned ship off an island in the Bahamas and went ashore. She flipped through a couple more pages, then shrugged. I think this is valid salvage. And really nice salvage. I can't believe they abandoned ship. Which island? Steve asked. Great Sail K? Sophia said. Occupied, Steve said. Well, if we ever run into them, and if they survived, I'll have to thank them. Now to check for zombies. I don't hear anything, Steve said, banging on the hatch again. Chairs had been barricaded against it, but they had been easy to clear. The rest of the ship, absent the crew compartment, was clear. And again, except for the debris of rapid exit, remarkably clean. You're the expert, da, Sophia said nervously. She had a headlamp and a flashlight, but she was still keeping an eye behind her. You and Faith enjoy this? Faith does, Steve said. Enjoy would be too much of a stretch for me. He levered the hatch open and flashed a light inside. Anybody home? Sophia asked. Not alive, Steve said, stepping into the compartment. One of the bodies had been partially eaten. The other was cut and bloated, but didn't appear to have died from violence. Probably the one killed the other, then died of dehydration, Steve said, checking the toilet. It was empty of water. Which makes this perfectly legal salvage, not to mention easy to clean. That's going to be nasty, Sophia said, looking in the room. Oh, gross. Yeah, that's not the worst I've seen by a stretch, Steve said, taking out a baggie. We'll just seal the room up fairly tight, vent it to the rear, and let these do their work. He dribbled the beetles on the corpses. Say hello to my little friends. Steve, these are way beyond me, Stacy said, looking at the engines. We've got fuel in the tanks, Steve said. Some, and a jumper battery. Can you get them running? I don't know, Stacy said. I mean, that's the point. These are huge professional engines. I'm not sure where to start. I think that's the start button, Sophia said, pointing. I can see that, Sophia, her mother said tartly. Just let me look over the manuals. Steve looked up at a rumble from below. A moment later, the lights in the saloon came on. I knew I married that girl for a reason. Think you can get that alongside without wrecking it? Mike called over the radio. Trying, Steve said to himself. He wasn't going to pick up the radio when he was trying to con the large up to the Victoria. The large really was, and it had a lot more sail area than the toy. He picked up the radio. 
just have the bloody balloons down. There is no such thing as too slow, he muttered. That wasn't the worst coming alongside I've ever seen, Mike said, looking around the interior. Say, you know how you told me I could have a boat? We'll have to call a captain's conference, Steve said. This is, among other things, going to take some serious crew. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the washed up leavings of a 2015 tsunami of triumphs and joys and a diplodocus honk of extenuating circumstances. Thanks and praise for Eric Flint and Andrew Dennis, authors of 1635 parcel of robes. Happy New Year from all of us at Bain Books. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. The Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama. Presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. <laughs>